Dostoevsky is the only psychologist from whom I have anything to learn. Our modern society is sick. It stifles the best instincts of man and values his worst vices. It opposes an ascending mode of living and promotes that which is anti-nature. Man has made himself sick through a long process of self-domestication, through physical degradation, through moral corruption. In fact, so-called morality is precisely the instrument by which mankind becomes cattle, by which a potentially heroic individual is suppressed and becomes a member of the herd. Only the select few, only free spirits can liberate themselves of these shackles and transcend the slave morality of modern times and live vigorously according to their highest instincts, according to nature and according to the law of strength and vitality. There exists a type of man who does not fit into this world, who is born with another set of instincts than the herd animal, who is born with a sword and shield, the strong type. He does not belong in this society. He is cast out, relegated to the shadows, to the underworld, to dark and hidden crevices. He is looked upon with disgust, with malice. This is the criminal. And both Nietzsche and Dostoevsky have something interesting to say about him, or rather, about his psychology. Today we're looking at one of the more provocative passages in Twilight of the Idols, one of Nietzsche's mature works. Radical in tone, grand in conclusion, and deep in analysis. It features a rare mention of Dostoevsky in Nietzsche's published works, and he gives him one of the greatest compliments ever. He calls him the only psychologist from whom he has anything to learn. Speaking of learning things, if you want to top up on some essential philosophy skills, like logic and scientific thinking, look no further than Brilliant.org, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant's interactive learning platform allows you to learn or revisit math and science in a way that teaches you valuable analytical thinking skills. They offer thousands of lessons in logic, AI, neural networks and more, with new lessons added every single month. It's not just about memorizing equations either. The puzzles that Brilliant offers are structured in such a way as to really build your intuition and thinking patterns. The interactive nature of the lessons makes learning math and other hard subjects that much easier. And their course on logic is a great refresher for anyone interested in philosophy. Logic being the backbone of philosophy, of course. Don't overlook this subject in your quest for knowledge. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free, for a full 30 days, Visit brilliant.org slash Veldgeist or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now, back to Nietzsche. Before we can understand the criminal, we need to understand his environment. In the introduction to this video, we sketched out the rough outlines of a state of things that Nietzsche would call decadence. Decadence is one of those Nietzschean concepts that is notoriously difficult to define. Clues are scattered throughout Nietzsche's writings, and it's up to the reader to piece things together and form a holistic picture. Two things are for certain though. 1. Nietzsche considered modern times to be thoroughly decadent. And 2. He speaks about it in terms of disease, an affliction, metaphorically but also literally at times. We get very close to a formal definition in one of his final works, The Antichrist. I call an animal, a species, an individual, corrupt, when it loses its instincts, when it chooses, when it prefers, what is injurious to it. Life appears to me as an instinct for growth, for survival, for the accumulation of forces, for power. Whenever the will to power fails, there is disaster. My contention is that all the highest values of humanity have been emptied of this will, that the values of decadence, of nihilism, now prevail under the holiest names. Immediately we see a connection with another Nietzschean concept, the will to power. There is a lot happening in this very short passage. Look at the concepts that are mentioned and how they play with one another. Decadence and nihilism are interlinked. The will to power is the opposite of decadence. Life is an instinct for power. It follows that whatever is anti-life must be decadent. All that saps away the feeling of power, the instinct for power, leads to nihilism. Furthermore, Nietzsche says that all the highest values of mankind, 
its holiest names now bear the mark of decadence and nihilism. They have been emptied of the will to power. They have been emptied of life. He speaks in terms of humanity, not in terms of individuals. Evidently, this thing called decadence doesn't just afflict individuals in an isolated fashion, but it also seems to infect entire societies, hell, even all of humanity. Clearly, something, somewhere, has gone terribly wrong. In the genealogy of morals, Nietzsche sketches out the history of our morality. This seminal work tells the tale of two moralities, one opposed to the other, slave morality versus master morality. The master morality is the morality of the aristocrat, the warrior type. It's the morality of affirmation, of saying yes to life. It's the morality of conquest, of growth, of power. It was the original morality, if you can even call it a morality. It was simply the way things were. The strong lived their lives and decided one day to call their mode of being good. It's good to conquer, good to acquire riches, good to be with women, to hunt, to fight to command. But what about those on the other end of the stick? What about those who are commanded? What about them? A master requires a slave, and a slave might revolt. What Nietzsche dubbed the slave revolt in morals is a moment in history during which the ressentiment of the slaves, their dissatisfaction with being commanded and oppressed, becomes creative in giving birth to values, values opposite of the master moralities. What the aristocrats called good must now become bad. What the aristocrats deemed bad must now become good. It's bad to conquer, bad to acquire riches, bad to be with women, to hunt, to fight, bad to command. But how did this revolt come to be? Certainly not through physical means. The slaves, almost by definition, are too weak for that. No, the revenge of the slaves was not of the violent kind. Their revenge took place on another plane than the physical. It took place beyond this world. If you're feeling charitable, you can say that their revenge was metaphysical. And if you're not, you can say that it was imaginary. The revolt of the slaves in morals begins in the very principle of resentment becoming creative and giving birth to values. A resentment experienced by creatures who, deprived as they are of the proper outlet of action, are forced to find their compensation in an imaginary revenge. However, Through the long march of history, this revolt ended up being a success. Slave morality gained the upper hand, as Christianity, the ultimate expression of resentment, the slave morality par excellence, completely took over the world, both in a physical and in a moral sense. The revolt of the slaves begins in the sphere of morals, that revolt which has behind it a history of two millennia and which at the present day has only moved out of our sight, because it has achieved victory. Do not doubt, by the way, that the victory was achieved, because just consider to whom in Rome itself nowadays you bow down, as though before the quintessence of all the highest values, and not only in Rome, but almost over half the world, everywhere where man has been tamed or is about to be tamed. The phraseology is once again very interesting. Nietzsche speaks of man being tamed. What is he referring to? Well, specifically, he is talking about colonialism, as in the historical context of Nietzsche's own time, being colonized meant being converted to Christianity, but more broadly speaking, he meant becoming civilized. Christianity equals civilization equals the taming of man. What is domestication? Generally speaking, it's the process by which mankind actively breeds certain species of animal in order to instill into them a genetic predisposition towards a human presence. In simpler terms, we selectively breed animals until they become useful to us. Nietzsche argues that in order to make civilization possible, man must to a degree domesticate himself. The pre-moral, pre-civilization age of mankind was brutal. Nasty surprises lurked everywhere. Mankind was barbaric, violent, aggressive in many ways. It allowed for our survival, But it was also detrimental to the development of civilization. Being a violent brute might serve you well in the Paleolithic tribal context, but that becomes a liability as human organization becomes more complex, as civilization starts to build. For civilization, man needs to be reasonable. 
He must control his anger and his darker impulses. He must adhere to a code of conduct. The first laws and religions and morals are created at this stage. But take a look at what actually takes place. Man's primal instincts become suppressed. If there is a dispute between two people, they can't just resort to violence like in the old days. They have to abide by a code of law, or a chief judge in the tribe must speak justice, or whatever the agreement was. The violent instinct is suppressed. In making man less violent in general, he also becomes more calculable, more reasonable, more predictable. That's all very good if your goal is to get a society going. You want members to be good, orderly, dutiful contributors, not violent brutes prone to sudden bouts of aggression. Nietzsche argues that this was a spontaneous development in the history of humanity, necessary to accommodate the increasing needs of a society as it grows in complexity and scale. This great prehistoric work, as he calls it, required the suppression of mankind's primal instincts, most notably for violence. It was a long work, and mankind has become quite successful at it. The days of prehistoric dangers are over. Have you seen any tigers lately? But the suppression of our violent instincts comes at a price. But thereby he introduced that most grave and sinister illness, from which mankind has not yet recovered, the suffering of man from the disease called man, as the result of a violent breaking of his animal past, the result, as it were, of a spasmodic plunge into a new environment and new conditions of existence, the result of a declaration of war against the old instincts, which up to that time had been the staple of his power, his joy, his formidableness. In short, civilization makes us weak. By suppressing the fundamental instincts of life, it fosters decadence. It creates a society which valorizes the lowest things as the highest things, the things most opposed to life as the highest virtues. In other words, it takes away our power. For society to function, we need to become dependable, productive members of it. We need to be reasonable, non-violent, cooperative, soft-spoken, well-mannered, accommodating. We need to fit in. The criminal is so bad at fitting in that we remove him from society, either through imprisonment or even through death. But how should we look at criminals through a Nietzschean lens? We can put all the previous pieces together and create a psychology of the criminal. Let's give it a shot. We started out with Nietzsche's diagnosis of modern society. We voluntarily relinquish part of our power in order to have a functioning society. We curtail our most primal, violent instincts and surrender ourselves willingly to a principle of order, something beyond ourselves, be that through the rule of law, religion, or more fundamentally, a system of morality. We shape ourselves according to society's needs. We become members of the herd. We become dependable, productive, calculable cogs in the machine. In short, we domesticate ourselves. And just like with animal husbandry, this is a slow process, millennia in the making. Gradually, we give away power more and more. But in doing so, we open up ourselves to a disease. Society has become sick, decadent. Decadence being the end result of a decline in power, in vitality, in strength. We may suppress our instincts, but that doesn't mean that they are gone. Quite the contrary. When our instincts are not allowed to find an external outlet, this drive for violence and aggression, innate to all of us, is turned inwards. We don't hurt others, we hurt ourselves. This self-inflicted pain is the modern malaise. Here we find nihilism, meaninglessness, weltschmerz, whatever word you want to use to describe the modern feeling of emptiness that seems so common today. But not all of us have been tamed. Not all of us have completely internalized their drive for aggression, for conquest, for violence, for power. In some individuals, these drives are externalized. They lash out against the world. They do not fit in. We call them criminals. Of course, the criminal is sick too. Everyone in a decadent society is sick to a degree. Except for some individuals, but we'll get to those exceptions soon enough. For now, consider the regular, run-of-the-mill criminal. He leads a subterranean existence, always on the run for the law, always in hiding, always clandestine, always looking for an outlet for his drives, not able to indulge them in the bright light of the sun. He prefers the dark of the night. 
The criminal is a strong man made sick, floating in a weird twilight zone between a desire for violence and a desire to remain in society. He is not completely suppressing his instincts, which is what makes him strong, but he needs to suppress them somewhat, which makes him weak. The criminal is a paradox. He is a strong man who is also weak. The criminal type is the type of the strong man amid unfavorable conditions, a strong man made sick. He lacks the wild and savage state, a form of nature and existence which is freer and more dangerous, in which everything that constitutes the shield and sword in the instinct of the strong man takes place by right. Society puts a ban upon his virtues. The most spirited instincts inherent in him immediately become involved with the depressing passions, with suspicion, fear and dishonor. But this is almost a recipe for physiological degeneration. The criminal is plagued by the fundamental unhealthiness of having to exercise his instincts in secret, clandestinely, underground. He lacks a healthy outlet for his natural desires. In the end, even the criminal himself comes to view these healthy instincts as something fatal, and he succumbs to the degeneracy that plagues all those around him. It is society, our tame, mediocre, castrated society, in which an untutored son of nature who comes to us from his mountains or from his adventures at sea must necessarily degenerate into a criminal. Nietzsche here flips the traditional sociology on its head. Rather than viewing the criminal as the odd one out, the undesirable, the outcast, Nietzsche says that it's society who is sick and weak, and it's the criminal who is fundamentally healthy and strong. This echoes an earlier point of critique Nietzsche has made about the sociology of his time, elsewhere in his works. These new sociologists take the rotten state of the modern world as the default, or even as the ideal. My objection to the whole of English and French sociology still continues to be this, that it only knows the decadent form of society from experience, and with perfectly childlike innocence, takes the instincts of decline as the norm, the standard of sociological valuations. But back to the criminal. Nietzsche argues that the criminal is fundamentally of the strong type. Aside from his own works and thoughts, does he have any supporting argument? Yes, he does. He quotes with approval the account of none other than Dostoevsky. Concerning the problem before us, Dostoevsky's testimony is of importance. This profound man found the Siberian convicts among whom he lived for many years these thoroughly hopeless criminals for whom no road back to society stood open, very different from what he had expected. That is to say, carved about from the best, the hardest and most valuable material that grows on Russian soil. Nietzsche is referring to a work of Dostoevsky's that's perhaps not as well known today. The House of the Dead, or Prison Life in Siberia, is a semi-autobiographical novel of Dostoevsky detailing his time in a Siberian prison camp. The novel has fictional elements and is indeed framed as fiction, but it's largely based on Dostoevsky's actual experience, making it a valuable eyewitness account of life among criminals in the dreaded tundra of Siberia. Dostoevsky spent four years in a forced labor Siberian prison camp, being sent there for his involvement in an anti-Tsarist literary circle. The novel details not only the brutalities he witnessed, but it also features some psychological profiles of his fellow inmates. And it's in these profiles that Nietzsche finds a voice of agreement with his own assessment of the criminal constitution. Consider, for example, the following passage that appears near the end of the book. How much joyless youth, how much strength for which there was none, was buried, lost in those walls, youth and strength of which the world might surely have made some use. For I must speak my thoughts as to this. The hapless fellows there were perhaps the strongest, and, in one way or another, the most gifted of our people. There was all that strength of body and of mind lost, hopelessly lost. Whose fault is that? Throughout the novel, too, in descriptions of the convicts, Dostoevsky stresses their strength, both mental and physical. For any fan of Dostoevsky, especially fans of Dostoevsky as a psychologist, The House of the Dead is rewarding reading. But let's return to Nietzsche again. Earlier we mentioned that the criminal is someone who refuses to fit into regular society, but who is eventually molded by it anyway, as he succumbs to the degeneracy all around him, and comes to view his constitution as a weakness, instead of a strength. But what if the criminal in question is in fact stronger than the society which surrounds him? 
In these rare, exceptional cases, we find an individual with the power to shape epochs. Society does not change him. He changes society. Such a strong individual is exceptionally rare. But we have one example ready. There are cases in which such a man shows himself to be stronger than society. The Corsican Napoleon is the most celebrated case of this. In fact, Nietzsche goes on to argue that every exceptional man is marked with the stamp of the criminal, at least initially. How many geniuses live lives of quiet desperation, until at last posterity recognizes their gifts? How many scientists are mocked and ridiculed for their crazy ideas which turn out to be true in the end? How many philosophers are unrecognized in their life? As Nietzsche wrote, some men are only born after they die. And Nietzsche himself was a case of this. But almost all those creatures whom, nowadays, we honor and respect, formerly lived in this semi-sepulchral atmosphere, the man of science, the artist, the genius, the free spirit, the actor, the businessman, and the great explorer. As long as the priest represented the highest type of man, every valuable kind of man was depreciated. And so Nietzsche draws a line from the criminal, the outcast, the reject, the downtrodden, the untouchable, straight to the genius, the artist, the scientist, the philosopher. Not that these are criminally inclined, but that they also live a life in the shadows and seek to impose their will on the society around them, perhaps not physically, but certainly mentally or artistically. They don't allow themselves to fit into society's mold. They rise above the herd and they become exceptional. Almost every genius knows the Catilinarian life as one of the stages in his development, a feeling of hate, revenge and revolt against everything that exists, that has ceased to evolve. Catiline, the early stage of every Kaiser. Thank you for watching. This video turned out to be longer than expected and we want to thank our patrons who keep the channel alive with their generous support. If you want to help out the channel and make the creation of these videos possible, and also get access to more than 10 exclusive videos, check out our Patreon page. For more Nietzsche, you can check out our video on why Nietzsche loved Dostoevsky, as well as our video on Nietzsche and how to become exceptional. Again, thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.